tall order to not add more confusion. <laughs> so we have a long passage, um, not as long as some, but one that has 17 verses that could be 17 different sermons. So listen now for the word of God from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 16, on page 93 in your pew Bible. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, the leader and a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. John 3.16. If you're a sports fan, you may have seen this in the stands. It's sometimes called stadium theology. And this verse is arguably the most famous single verse in the Bible, at least in the United States for the last 50 years. And I'm not sure how many people actually know the verse, but there are so many signs held up in these stadiums that it has earned that name. Many evangelical Christians would see this as the one verse that you need to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <coughs> well, it's a pretty good summary, isn't it? For a particular kind of theology, in a particular time and place. And even though it may seem to many that this verse sums up the core Christian message, there are many messages that we might extract. I attempted last week, as I addressed the confirmands in a charge, I tried to sum up the message in one summary that came from Jesus' summary, that loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself this could summarize much of what we believe and where we start. That of a loving God, loving oneself, and loving one's neighbor. I think that people are always looking for that nugget or that nutshell, the gospel in a nutshell. It helps us to 
summarize and make sense of a library of books written thousands of years ago and extracted from oral traditions over hundreds and hundreds of places and times. When my wife and I were married, newly married, in 1987, we ventured to India to study world religions, particularly Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism, and Christianity. Many don't realize, but there are more Christians in India, perhaps, than the United States, depending on the year. And the curriculum from this trip, for this trip was to meet people in their home context, their setting in life, what we call from the historical, critical, biblical studies from the German, because they invented it, the Sitz im Leben. So it was an amazing whirlwind of a tour in the summer heat and dust of the subcontinent, meeting pastors, doctors, professors, missionaries, merchants from all nationalities in places like Delhi, Pune, Mumbai, Bengaluru, Kerala, Mudurai, and Chennai. One day, our itinerary took us to meet the first woman to be ordained in the Danish church. She was a missionary in the Church of South India, and she put us to work immediately. She sent us to a bazaar market with a man called Bapu to deliver one-page tracts, and as she put it, these tracts summarize the gospel. It's the gospel in a nutshell, in English, to which the smarty pants seminarians questioned. Well, if they read, do they read in English? If they are actually literate? Well, I will never forget her bold statement back to us. Children from all over the region will pick up this tract at the market. They will take it home to villages in the whole region and read it this evening, the gospel in a nutshell. Well, it felt a little absurd because it reminded me of our class back in Princeton with Professor Moffat, one of the first families of the Chinese mission, who waxed poetic about the times when the whole graduating class of Princeton Seminary ventured forth in the mission field around the turn of the century. And at the same, same time, she had a point, even though it was sort of a bygone era. era this was social media on the ground in India in 1987. And she wasn't the first ordained woman in the Danish church for nothing. She put us to work and we delivered the tracts. Well, perhaps Nicodemus came to Jesus that night for a nutshell of the message. And I invite you to ponder the early part of our reading today, the part about Nicodemus specifically coming to Jesus. And for some reason, this story has always stuck with me, maybe because it gives a little context, a little place to the John 3.16 verse that we all grew up where I came from, seeing along the roads of Appalachia, John 3.16, the answer, the nutshell to all things. I must have heard my mother and father talking about this, or my pastor, because the story has some color and passion, and I remembered it. The picture etched in my memory was of a thoughtful and sophisticated man in good clothing, better clothing than the simple garb of Jesus or John the Baptist, a nice robe. He's older because he was a Pharisee who had enough stature to attain a place in the Sanhedrin, the high court of Jerusalem. The context I remember from my childhood stories was that he was one of the Pharisees who was trying to do a good thing. After all the lambasting of Pharisees, this one maybe was a good one. And I remember him fondly as one of the outsiders who started getting the Messianic message even before the inside group of disciples and followers got it. Much like the Samaritan woman in the following story. They see before the people close to Jesus see. But then I see him in my mind's eye, coming at night. At night? Why? Because 
He was afraid to let anyone know that he wants to connect with this Jesus. I remember this detail because it was presented to me as a courageous act, as an act of taking a risk, and not as a coward, how it's often sometimes viewed. viewed. Will he be able to make sense of Jesus in this night visitation? Will he try to appropriate Jesus into his worldview? I'm not really sure what actually happens because the text isn't clear. The dialogue kind of drops off and Jesus begins to teach. And Nicodemus seems to be a little clueless. He's like the very educated person who is so literal that they don't understand the symbols and images and the intuitive leaps that John gives us, the puns, the parables, full of it in the Greek. Indeed, Jesus is not giving us a literal message here, but one in keeping with John's genre. This genre called the gospel, for John, is a very unique way of writing. You can't say very unique, sorry. A unique way of writing. <laughs> unique is one, right? But this one gospel is strikingly different. It's absolutely mystical and then earthly at the same time. The story of the word, logos, coming to earth, God's spirit now arriving, alive, now. And then referring back in this passage to creation, as it did in the prologue, in the beginning was the word. And then back to Moses with the project of freedom, with a serpent he's lifting up. Lots of literary illusion and foreshadowing is going on in this gospel. So Nicodemus, for all his trouble and his earnestness, is standing there missing the point. And Jesus says as much. But he continues to teach, for this story is an emblematic story, probably for all those early faith communities that were struggling with their Jewishness and their Christianity, and what direction would they take. Here in person, we have someone at the height who could bridge that gap, the height of Judaism, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, a meticulous scholar of the Torah, and a judge making this attempt to find out who this man is, living into the burning question of this man wandering around, changing the world nearby. That central question of Nicodemus and the early church, in the midst of a rising kind of flow of rabbinic Judaism moving out and away from the temple, is who is this Jesus? Where does he stand in our tradition? And how is he connected to God and spirit? So we have to remember when we read this gospel, as with any gospel, Nicodemus, the character, did not have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. He's there in the night, under the cover of darkness, and he comes and he asks Jesus in these everyday words, Rabbi, we all know that you are a teacher straight from God. For no one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't behind it. And what I find most amazing about these words and this statement is that he isn't leaning on the cliches. It's real. He's not quite sure who Jesus is. But he says this in a forward way in the night with a level of honesty that is quite refreshing. It's like one of our statements of faith that could come from a confirmand, or perhaps from any one of us, given the moment when we move into the absolute honesty of not really knowing everything we want to know about Jesus. When we talk about our faith, rarely do we hear these days someone proclaim, well, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, right? He's the Messiah, the Son of God. We hear people probing and reaching for more language to understand who Jesus is, was, and will become. 
And these terms that we use in church so often, so freely, sometimes get in the way of the free thinking and the probing that we need to do. The language has taken on more and more weight over 2,000 years, 3,000 years. So what Nicodemus says has some kind of contemporary relevance. I find it refreshing. Indeed, it sounds like what a lot of people say to me out there when they learn I'm a pastor. They say, oh, that Jesus was a good guy. He's a good teacher and he did good. And, and frankly, I think you don't need to go to church if you do good things. That's what it's all about, right? So the guru, the great teacher, we got that far with Nicodemus. He was willing to concede that. And maybe... We are closer to Nicodemus than we think. Maybe we only really visit Jesus in that hard way in the nighttime, in the dark. Not in the public square, but in the intimacy of our inner thoughts and our prayers. And our honest assessment of who Jesus was and is and will become is quite simply uttered with similar doses of uncertainty, doubt, and the limits of knowledge and the limits of language that stick with us in this age where we are, we are asked to prove and to have evidence and to bring more information forward. But remember, he's a Pharisee who has looked at the law with meticulousness. He is so high up in the Sanhedrin that he is learned. It sort of sets him up. And I'm not sure if Jesus and John, in the writing of this, meant for him to look foolish or to just make this into the teaching moment that the early church needed to say, this is a Jewish person of the highest order who could cross over and speak in both worlds. But he does look a little foolish. What were the early church followers to do with this new teaching. Jesus was doing things that were very unusual. Healing, casting out demons. This intense presence of the Spirit is disturbing. It's incredibly powerful and sometimes too hard to handle. It cannot be controlled. It cannot be systematized. And certainly, it cannot be put into a nutshell. So in these passages, I believe Jesus is showing us not only the power of the Spirit, and not only the linkage with Moses and creation, but also the freedom of someone who is encountering Spirit and opening themselves and again and again to Spirit and inviting us to do the same. Born from above, born Again, born in a new way. So we have some trouble as religious folks sometimes with trying to name everything and give the language and the quality of a systematic system to it all. In fact, we're, we're, as Presbyterians, we spend a lot of time doing that, striving to make creeds and say what we believe and study the ancient texts and work with philosophy and theology. All of this defining work, we're trying to reach out and put our hands on God, bring God into order. And yet Jesus' message continually confounds us with spirit that's wild and free. Well, does Nicodemus get there? I don't know if you're wondering, but I have a place in my heart for him does he get there? Well, not in this reading today. He's left looking ridiculous. But later we learn, later in John, we learn that he argues at the Sanhedrin for a fair trial for Jesus. And then he's ridiculed. Surely you are not from Galilee, are you? Implying that Galilee was the rural place for country bumpkins like Jesus, who could come up with such heresies and treasonous language. I still picture Nicodemus as an amazing person. Even though he may have been cowardly that night, I see him as someone who began to take more and more risks 
on a journey, on a voyage, with great, great gifts to lose. If he crossed the line too much, he not only would lose his stature in the community of Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, but also among the Romans, his life was at stake. So we need to be careful how we judge him. And in fact, it's never our judge job to judge. But let's learn from him as he is on the way to Christ, just as we all are. And in the end, he is the one, in the very end, he is the one who helps Joseph of Arimathea with the burial of Jesus. Perhaps one of the most risky acts in all of the stories. When the disciples had fled into hiding and the women were there with the secret followers, they came forward and took care of the body of Jesus, showing their love, and showing that their journey was real.